Can you reach over and grab your neighbor's, neighbor's hand, please? Amy, can you put the words back up? Dear Heavenly Father, we stand hand in hand. And we thank you, Father God, for all that you have done in and through us. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to minister. We thank you, Father, for all the relationships that we've had. We thank you, Father God, for all the giving we've done. We thank you for all the lives we've touched. We thank you, Father, for all the lives that have touched us. Father, there's been a crushing. This song is becoming an anthem, Father. We're ready to be made new wine. Use us how you want to. Maybe in the past I've sought for what we wanted. Father, we stand before you today asking what do you want? And how do you want to use us? And where do you want to send us? You know, the thing about wine is not the crushing. It's the aging. Father, help us to receive all from the old and apply all the new that comes. We love you, we praise you, we give you everything that we have. We let go of all the things Nisi was talking about. We stop taking the leaves and trying to patch and cover up, and we just come before you naked, ashamed, and ask for forgiveness. We say, cleanse us, make us whole and use us. Take the coal, cleanse our lips. Anoint us again, Father God, to do your work. But more importantly, Father God, anoint this house to seek your face once again. That we would have your presence with us in this corporate setting, in the closets, in the in the cars, in the in the living rooms, in the TVs and in the uh, the radios and all that we let enter our life, let only the presence of Jesus be at the forefront. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Shake hands, hug next, tell someone you love them, tell them you're glad they're here this morning. Awesome job, praise and worship. Y'all give him a hand. Okay, let's get ready for, uh, uh, for uh, tithes and offerings. I need your help. We have, to, we have to put in an AC, and 
first, I need you to pray that uh, he will give us a good deal. And then uh, we need the money, too. So I need you all to pray that that comes in, okay? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We ask for your favor. We ask, Father God, for uh, uh, you to uh, bless us with the funds to to replace the one that is dead and then, Father God, to fix the one that is broken. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask for your mercy. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives. We ask that you bless the sower, and you said you give seed to the sower, and we thank you for it, Father. Bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all give Pastor Annette a hand as she comes forward. Can, can, can I just say something about giving today? You know, we wholeheartedly believe in tithing. And I'm going to say something. And I, we believe in generosity in the spirit of God. But today's Pentecost. And today's the day that they would bring. It's funny because you did banner this morning. We, we were waving. They would bring in the new harvest. This was the day they celebrated it. And they'd have to bring a free will offering. And they would wave it before the Lord. And they were blessing God for the harvest that was and the harvest that is to come. And I've always believed that you should sow a special seed on Pentecost. That's my own doctrinal belief. It's the, it's the, it's the feast of first fruits. That's what this is. So I was in, on the car on the way over here, and um, we got a refund check from our insurance company um, for $285. And I said, woo, woo, Mama got some money. I was all excited. And I'd already determined how I was going to spend it. And on the way here, the Lord said, you're going to give that refund check to me today because it's part of the harvest and it's part of your free will offering this morning. And so between that and Pastor Woody talked about reactivation, and I'm going to be prophetic and your elder for a moment. But the way that this church functions is not because we're part of a denomination. We are a body of believers who give. I am astounded that you guys give. I tell you what, we have a wonderfully giving church. Do not get me wrong. But there's a lot of people that don't tithe anymore. And that not tithing is what's stretching us. And if you're fed here and you're part of this body, if you can't tithe, then you need to give something, beloved. As we sow, we reap. And then the, that's, that goes for any man, whether believer or non-believer. Whatever a, man sa- what, whatever a man soweth, that too shall he reap is what the word says. But he says that he will give... He will give generously and liberally to the son, to the one who gives in faith into the kingdom of God. And so we want to be blessed beyond measure. And we want to be able to give more, not just receive. And so I'm just going to encourage you to reactivate the things that you've let die. And I'm also going to ask you to ask the Lord, if it's not today and he tells you on Wednesday, y'all can give any time, day or night, online. Don't have to be in church to do it. But just give. Ask what God would have you to do. Amen? Because I know you're all, today's a great day because you're all sweating. Hallelujah. How do ties work? They fix ACs. Woo-woo. Amen. So there you go. Amen. I'm not uncomfortable talking about it either. I don't care. I love Jesus. And trust me, there ain't no way I should be making life. We took such a pay cut. We went into the ministry. But God is so faithful. He's so amazing. I was sitting in Ricky's chair the other day, and I was looking, and I was like, I looked at the house from his chair, not from my chair. You know what I mean? And the house looks so different from his perspective. I was like, oh, my God, when I'm sitting over here, I was like, I had a whole new appreciation for my home. And I was like, Lord, thank you for my house. I, didn't, I, didn't, I haven't seen how pretty this is. <laughs> I only see it from my little angle. And sometimes you just got to move your seat and move your location so that you can look, so that you can see things a little bit differently. Because if you never change your position, Everything looks the same. Amen. I love you. I am messed up. The Holy Ghost just wrecked me. Lord have mercy. You threw my straw away. I'm like totally like freaking out. <laughs> I'm like, anyways, how's it going? Aren't my shoes pretty? They're really old and they're gorgeous, but guess what's about to happen? Whoop, whoop. Mama's taking them off. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. I know. She mopped the floor, too. And I almost killed myself. I'm like, Jesus, I don't need to be raised from the dead up in this joint today. Break my neck. Oh, look, my feet are already swollen. I'm hot. And when, you know, warm things 
grow, right? <laughs> it's not fat. We're just enlarging as we get hot. Amen. <laughs> I better get my glasses. It's Pentecost today. Woo-woo. All right. Now, some of y'all may not be excited about that, and I'm about to change your mind. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. If you don't love us, you should love our babies. Our babies are in here during the day. <laughs> They're dying too. All right. Oh. Well, on the inside and underneath, I'm one hot mama. Woo, Jesus. So if I look crazy on the outside, <laughs> you can see me underneath. All right. Okay. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Christ in us, the greatest New Testament event of the age is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that more than teaching about the Holy Spirit, that the demonstration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the manifestation of the fruit of God is the most important thing that any of us will ever do on the earth. You can talk about being filled with the Spirit, but if you don't have the Spirit of God working in you and through you, it's not going to matter. Because the only way broken people are going to know that God is alive and is fully able to do anything that they need done for them is if mature sons and daughters filled with the Holy Spirit walk in the power and the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit of God. Oh, Jesus. I was laughing because Monday night we called for prayer, and you guys rocked. I didn't realize how many people were here. We had a great prayer service, and then Christina was doing attendance, and then we were like, we had to, so I had to go in the system. And was, I saw that there were 12 people. I'm a prophet. I'm like, governmental order. I'm all excited, right? So then today, as I was writing down some things I felt like the Lord was giving me, I made these points, and I counted them, and it was seven. I was like, Holy Spirit. <laughs> so we're going to talk about seven points today about the infilling and the, the, the Spirit of God. And this is by no means a deep teaching, okay? We're just going to hit the surface of some things when it comes to the Spirit of God and man. So are you a man? Amen. You're a man. You're a woman. So he's not, we're not talking about something obscure. It's talking about for us, okay? So, oh, Jesus, I'm excited. So we started all this off in Ezekiel 37 a couple weeks ago. Amen? Dead bones coming to life. He said, prophesy, son of man. To the breath, the wind of the Spirit. Prophesy who? The prophet, son of man. You and I, all, you may not be a prophet in the fivefold ministry um, office, but all of us have the spirit of prophecy and we have the spirit of God in us, which we'll get to that in a second. And that means we're allowed to stand as God and speak God's word and watch God's word manifest and become active in the earth and change what is dead to make it alive again. Amen. Amen. That's how we started this. So you remember that he said, pray and prophesy the breath of life, right? Okay. David, I'm going to need you today, brother. So you just be amen in me. Give me happy. Amen. I feel so scattered. The Holy Ghost just totally freaking messed me up. Okay, sorry. Whew. All right. So Psalms tells us um, that um, all of creation, we know it in Genesis also, but Psalms tells us that all of creation, all the plants, all the stars, and everything that is, was actually brought forth from the breath of God. So we know that everything that was made was made by God, right? And so we know that it was made by his spirit because his spirit is his breath, right? But outside of creation, if we just look at man and what God did with man, we know that the first thing, so our first point is that the wind and the breath of the spirit of life first came in to Adam. And the reason it's important we talk about Adam is because Adam is the first man. There you go. Amen. Y'all are following along. I love it. Okay. So Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life, and man became a living being. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul tells us again that the first man, Adam, became a living being. And the last Adam, which is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Oh, so good. So Adam became a living soul. 
Now, we talk about the word life here. We're not talking about biology life, like we can feel and touch that stuff. We're talking about Zoe life. You've been around me any time. You've heard this before, so I'm going to say it again, and I don't care. Zoe life is the, the energy. It is the force. It's what makes God God and all of that he is. That is what Zoe is. And so when he breathed into Adam, he breathed all of that godness into Adam. And Adam became a, a living soul. He became a God-man. So as he was in the Garden of Eden, he was as much like God without being God as somebody could be. And that is why God said, I want you to, I'm going to put you here in the garden, and I want you to duplicate and fill up the, the earth so that the earth will look like me, that the earth will look like heaven. But we know that at row, Adam made a mistake, right? We know that Adam, he ate of the fruit, and what came, to, what came to man? Death. Now, Adam still had biology life, right? He was still walking around living and breathing. So what died was the spirit, the living spirit, the God part of Adam is what died. But Paul tells us in Corinthians that even though the first Adam screwed it up, we have the last Adam who came, and he came bearing the same life-giving spirit that had Adam had breathed into him. Amen? We're going to get more of that for, in just a second. So we see that basically when you see the law of first mentions in the Bible, those things carry throughout the Word of God. That's, it's, it's a, it is a concrete foundation that whenever you read the Word of God and we see breath, and we see God's breath, we equal that to mean life. Right? It's the law of first mentions. So we know that Adam became a living soul. So the second thing is that after Adam fell, we had to have somebody come to the earth who could carry that Zoe, that living godness, once again, in the earth. Because up until then, nobody was able to. What would happen is God would raise somebody up. He would say, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Samuel, whoever it was, they would, he would raise them up. He would smear the anointing on him. The part, of, the part of the Spirit of God that empowers us, he would put that power on whoever that prophet was, whoever that person was, and that prophet was able to speak like God and see like God and hear what God had to say, and he was a mouthpiece. But that prophet was never filled with the Spirit of God. The anointing came upon him, and it was on him for a moment, and then it would leave. It could moment could be years, but you know what I mean? It was and it was for the purpose of God being able to speak to man through man. But that was never the divine that was never the, 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 the it was the divine order, but it wasn't ever his divine intention. He wanted man to be filled with him in the earth. So Jesus had to come. So the Lord said, Okay, since the first man messed it up, I have to have a man come and be born so that he can be just like the first Adam, but he has to be born of my spirit, right? So the second thing we have here, our second point, the first one is he breathed life into Adam, man. The second thing is Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit, okay? So in Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 35, it says, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. And listen, You'll become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great, eminent, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him, give to him the throne of his forefather David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages, and of his reign there'll be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no intimacy with any man as a husband? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and so the holy thing, the offspring which shall be born of you, will be called the Son of God. So because she didn't have relations with a man, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the breath of God came, overpowered her and overshadowed her, and Jesus was then conceived in her womb. So she, Jesus was then man, and he was God. Because Zoe overshadowed her, and impregnated her. So now we have again on the earth a God-man, just like Adam was a God-man. Y'all follow me? Y'all got it still? Okay. So, 
So this is important. Jesus had to be born of the Spirit. What does Jesus tell us that we have to be? Born of the Spirit. We cannot come unto the Father unless we've been born again. Because none of us are able to approach God because God is a spirit. And in order for us to come into the presence of a spirit, or the spirit really, we have to also be of spirit. Amen? So Jesus, had, now, Jesus, so he had to be born of the spirit. Our born-again salvation experience, of course, is it's, everything in our life hinges. That's the place in our life where we go from A.D. to B.C., or, BC, or from B.C. to A.D. It is, the, the, it is the, the time divider in our life where we go from being far away and dead in trespasses to becoming fully alive in Christ. And we should know the day that happened. We should be able to communicate to somebody when that encounter happened. I can tell you where I was, what I was wearing, who was preaching. I can tell you what I felt. I can tell everything in my life changed from that moment. I know when I was born again. I don't know much about my conception, thank you, Jesus. And I don't know nothing about my birth, thank you, Jesus, in the natural. But I can remember everything about my conception and my birth in the spirit. And Jesus was not able to forego the same thing you and I have to go through. He had to be born of the Spirit. So that is why no matter how much you, you may think you know God, if you can't look somebody in the eye and look Christ in the face and know that you've been born again, you're not born again. I love you. Oh, my God, I love you so much. And I'll say that in a mean way. I say that with great righteous earnest inside of my heart because we never know the moment or the hour where we may pass from this life. So we need to be prepared. And we're not trying to get people saved because we're afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. I'm never going to die, actually. That's what the Word tells me. I have now escaped death. Amen. You may kill this body, but you ain't killing me. <laughs> How's that for the devil? I tell you what, I'm like, he's like, great, I'd listen to her forever. I'm like, yes. How funny is that? Uh, all right. We have to be conceived by the Spirit. Now, the third thing, Jesus also had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So just like we had to be born of the Spirit, by the Spirit, Jesus did and we are. Now, Jesus also was baptized and filled. I want you to think about it as you being smeared on the outside with Christ and then being the top coming off of you and then you being filled up with Christ. Those are two different things. And you can go to heaven with being covered with Christ. You, don't have, you're, you'll, you won't pass up heaven just because you haven't been filled with the Spirit of God. You'll, you'll, you're, already, you're already there, according to the Word of God. You've already been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, all your sins have been washed away, and death has been defeated, and you are entering into the glory, the glory and the fulfillment of righteousness. And that nothing could ever steal that from you. But for you to have righteousness on you, and for you to be filled with the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whoa, two different things. One, somebody says, in the sweet by and by, glory to God, I'm going to go to heaven. And the other person says, I am a representative of heaven, and I am here bringing the kingdom of heaven, and don't you come near me with that. Two different mindsets. Who was it that was? Somebody. Oh, what was it? Uh, never mind. We were listening to some old hymns. Okay, never mind. <laughs> when we all get to heaven. I'm like, Hello. What happened? I thought we were in, we've already entered into the kingdom of God. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and liberty, right? The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So if we have the Holy Ghost, then we're already in heaven. We're already in the kingdom. We already have righteousness. We already have peace, and we already have joy. So it's not about the day we get to heaven, hallelujah. We get to do it now. Amen. Praise God. I know. When it's not so hot in here and that, I'll praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. 
poor Lauren said, it's so hot in here. I hate this room. I said, well, you ain't in Durban, South Africa right now with some Zulus sweating your booty off. So praise the Lord. Amen. So that's a different kind of heat, girl. Whew, Lord have mercy. Okay. So Jesus is baptized in Holy Spirit. So John chapter 1, you're going to read the Passion Translation. Verse 29 to 34 says, the very next day, John saw Jesus coming to him to be baptized. And John cried out, look, there is God's lamb. Oh, amen. He will take away the sins of the world. And I told you that a mighty one would come who is far greater than I because he existed long before I was born. My baptism was for the preparation of his appearing to Israel, even though I've yet to experience him. Then as John baptized Jesus, he spoke these words. I see the Spirit of God appear like a dove descending from the heavenly realm and landing upon him, and it rested upon him from that moment forward. That's the place we need to stop. <laughs> so Jesus, we know that Jesus did not commit one miracle before this, point, this, before this moment. He taught wonderfully, apparently, he had people in the, in the synagogue freaking out by the knowledge he had when he was just 12 years old. He talked to a whole lot of folk, knew a whole lot of the word, was actually teaching the teachers. But when he was filled with the Spirit of God at the River Jordan, when John the Baptist baptized him, the word says that the Holy Spirit descended. What, I thought he was already born of the Spirit. Well, he is, and he was. But the Holy Spirit descends from heaven and then it comes, and it doesn't just rest upon him. It remained on him. Oh, my God, this is so good. I love the Word of God so much. So now when he leaves that place, what happens? He goes straight to Cana, and there's a wedding going on. Rut roll, they ain't got no wine. Uh-oh. And what does he do? His first miracle. He takes the water, and he makes it become wine. It's his very first miracle. From that moment on, from when the Spirit of God infilled him and baptized him and remained in him, everything he did was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did nothing just because he was born of the Spirit. Oh, God. You can have revelation being born of the Spirit. You can have insight. You can have knowledge. You can have understanding. But you will not have power without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Amen, David. David was on the side of the road the other day, and I was rushing. I was late. I, saw him. I said, hi, David. I was waving all bad and kept on going. He's like, I feel better. He said he physically felt better as I drove by and waved at him. He's like, I don't need my walker today. I was like, praise God. That has nothing to do with me at all. Zero, not a zip. Because I was in a hurry, and if I was a real true pastor, I probably would have stopped and said, you need a ride? But I didn't. I was like, ha, see you later, and run him down the road. But if it was Lorinda, she rolled the window down and said, hey, Dave, I'll just stop what I'm doing. But I was like, I was late. But anyways, see, that's why. i sorry. I love you. But apparently God had grace on me and grace on him to know that that's not going to stop, but she's going to acknowledge you, and God gave him what he needed in that moment. That has nothing to do with me. That's just because the Spirit of God, I've been filled with, the Spirit of God. I don't just merely have him upon me. So I want you to think about this is so important when you, really, when you really wrap your brain around it because everything that Jesus did, he did because he was filled with the Spirit of God. So this should open wide our hearts to go, I can do everything Jesus does because that's what he's given us. And we have had this thinking in our lives, whether we admit it or not, it's a religious mindset that says, one day, in the future, one day. And he's like, no, today is the day. Now faith is, amen? Ah, all right. All right. So he was... I didn't care. Actually, Pops offered. I'll dig it out for you. I was like, we should have a straw in this joint for crafts. Couldn't find one. Anyways. Oh, well. I'm suffering for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> if somebody can go to Trey Magaeus and ask for a straw. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Jesus was born of the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit. Okay. Now, here's an important part. Jesus then, 
promised to the disciples and to you and I that he was going to give us his spirit. Without Okay, so let's go there. We've got to look at it. I love the book of John. Oh, my gosh. Okay, John 14. I cannot get out of John 14 right now. It's amazing. He says, okay, you know, I have preached. when The way the Passion says this, loving me empowers you to obey my commands. I just get floored every single time I read it because the Amplified says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So I've always thought, well, if I'm not obeying God, I must not be in love with him. Oh, my God, Jesus, help me love you more. You know what I mean? The cycle of, you know, shame, shame, shame. But that, that's not what it says. He says, when you love me, you're empowered to obey me. And this makes so much sense to me because when I first loved Jesus, I was stupid obedient. Because I was like so, I mean, I literally had, the, the, the Passion Translation talks about the infilling of the Spirit of God, the the gushing over of the, of the wind of the spirit over someone's life. It's like a radical gushing over inside of your heart. Well, that's what happened to me when I got saved. I was filled with the spirit when I got saved as well. I mean, it was crazy. I had a major encounter with the love of God. And I love God so much, I did not care how stupid I looked. I would tell anybody. I would say anything. I would go anywhere. I would do anything. I freaked people out. It was absolutely hilarious. And that went on for a while until I hung around church folk long enough to dumb me down. Because they were like, you're a little out there. You're scaring people in it. Because, you know, someone like Arthur would say, I have a headache. And we were at the printer, and I said, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> be healed. He looked at me like a cow at a new gate. He's like, what in the is wrong with you? And I looked at him. I was startled by his look at me. I was like, oh. My butt puckered. I'm like, oh, crap. You know what I mean? And then I was like, I said, how's your head? <laughs> he did not know what he, I feel better. He got, he just grabbed his papers and he went away. And I'm just like, yes. You know what I mean? I didn't care. I obeyed him. Why? Because I was ridiculously, radically loving Jesus. Every malfunction, every deficiency in my life, does not come because I have not obeyed God. It's come because I have not been fervently, passionately in love with him. And then that's when the disobedience comes in. That's when the complacency comes in as our heart passion for him begins to wane. And I've I've put a whole bunch of stuff in my heart over the last couple of years. And, And getting these things out of me has been difficult. But even this morning, I'm telling you what, just the mercy of God touching me so deeply. And the first thing I said to him was, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. But none of us do. He said, you're right, but take it. Okay, I'll take it. (laughs) Give me more. (laughs) Now I'm ugly crying. Uh The valiant man of God. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, the Bible says that when you receive a prophetic word, or when you bless a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. So I'm just going to say over to you right now, all I wanted was a straw. David wanted a drink of water from his home. And those men sacrificed, you didn't sacrifice your life right now. But I tell you what, God's going to bless you. There is a prophetic blessing coming to your house. I declare it this day in the name of Jesus. You better hold on to your hat, girlfriend. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all better be agreeing with that because if they get blessed, you get blessed. Amen. All right. So, loving me empowers you to obey my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Savior. What? I thought Jesus was the Savior. (laughs) He is the Savior. But so is the Spirit of Truth. Hello. The Holy Spirit of Truth. He will be a friend to you just like me. And he will never leave you. Can you imagine these guys hearing this? They're like, why do you keep telling us you're going to die? Stop telling us you're going to die. You're such a buzzkill, Jesus. Stop telling us you're going to die. And he's excited. Jesus is so ready to go to the cross. He's not telling him, I've got to die, and it's going to be so horrible. And you're going to be so sad, and it's going to be so hard for you. He's like, woohoo! I get to go away. And because I get to go away, I get to send to you the Spirit. 
who's going to be a friend to you just like me. He is a, he's just like me. He's as awesome as me. And all of his awesomeness that you love is going to be with you, and he's going to comfort you. He's going to be your friend, and he's never going to leave you. He's trying to get their hearts ready. He's like, there's, there's a moment that's coming when you're not going to see me. But yet, then again, you'll see me. And they're like, who's saying this? The one I the bed with, the bread with. Who's dipping bread? No one can figure nothing out. And he's like speaking so plain. But he's excited about leaving. He understands. If I don't go, you can never experience what I'm experiencing right now. You're looking at me, Jesus is looking at them, saying, you're looking at me, and you're so enthralled with me, and you've given your life to me, and I love that you've done that. But it, see, if I, if I stay, all you'll ever do is be an onlooker of what I can do. But if you let me go, then I can actually leave, and then I can give to you the thing that's making you marvel. And in that, then you can be just like me. Oh. See, carnal people want to keep what they got. Carnal people like to hoard it in. It's mine. But Jesus is ready to die so he can give it away. Verse 18 says, I promise that I will never leave you helpless or abandon you as orphans. I will come back to you. Soon I will leave this world, and they'll see me no longer. But you will see me because I will live again, and you will come alive also. See, they're sitting there breathing, having lives, touching. All their senses are working, and they're thinking, what do you mean I'm going to come alive too? I'm not freaking dead. No, you're dead. They had no clue they were dead. They were no longer a living soul. They were just a soul. <laughs> Amen. So when that day comes, you will know that I am living in the Father, and that you are one with me, for I will be living in you. Those who truly love me are those who obey my commands. Whoever passionately loves me will be passionately, be, be passionately loved by my Father, and I will passionately love you in return and will manifest my life within you. Oh, my gosh. Passion, 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 passion. <laughs> no one likes a boring lover. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you're passionate. Amen. But this promise here is vital because Jesus knows that he cannot give all of himself to the people unless he willingly lays down his life. See, they need to be able to receive the living part of the living soul that they were supposed to be. And if they need, if, if we need that, then that means he has to give it to us. And the only way for him to give it to us is now laid on his life because he now embodies the fullness of the Spirit because the Spirit came to him in the Jordan River, baptized him, and remained upon him. And the Spirit of God was not going to go anywhere, that Jesus didn't go. He couldn't leave Jesus' body and go do what he wanted to do and then come back. Jesus carried the Spirit of God. So he had laid on his life. Let's look at Mark chapter 15. This is Jesus on the cross. It says, Jesus uttered a loud cry and uh, breathed out his breath. This is starting in verse 37. It says, And the curtain of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who, faced, who stood facing him saw him expire this way, he said, Really, this man was God's son. What did he say? Jesus uttered a loud cry and what? Breathed out his breath life. Oh, God. I get goose pimples. Oh, my gosh. He had in him the power to save him from the cross. Because there's nothing on the earth that could ever overpower the Spirit of God. Nothing. Nothing. Could maybe overpower man, but nothing could ever overpower the Spirit of God. Nothing, not even death, could overpower the Spirit of God. Because why? He is a living Zoe. He's a Zoe. He's, he is the source of life. You can't kill the source 
of life. It's like you trying to kill the sun or kill oxygen. You can't. So Jesus understood the only way for him to be able to give you and I redemption and to give us the spirit of God is he had to be willing to give up the very thing that could overpower what he was in the middle of. And it says he breathed out his breath. He had received the spirit of God. At the same time, he breathed out from his lungs. He breathed out of his spirit, and he allowed himself to expire physically and allowed himself to experience spiritual death at that moment because he was dying on our behalf. And he was being a well and pleasing sacrifice to the Father. Oh. Look, we know we celebrated Easter. We know three days later, Jesus came back to life. Amen. We know that the Spirit of God, even though it was not encased in the man anymore because Jesus was obedient and laid down his life, he was able to overcome death. He was able to overcome the grave, and he overcame hell. He took all of the keys. He took all of the, the kingdoms that the, the, the enemy had. He gathered them all up, kicked his butt, and so the Bible says he stripped him naked and pointed at him and laughed and took everything that he had. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're all going to get to heaven and be like, that's what we were so scared of? What? We should be more fascinated with the face of Jesus than we are the strength of the enemy because he has none. Amen. So, now, okay, can we take a detour real quick? Yes. Y'all better say yes. I'm doing it anyways. Look, I want to get home too. My mom is making Jaeger schnitzel today. Y'all should all be jealous. So if I had any incentive today to cut it short and go home, today is the day. But we're not. We're going to be hot and hungry. Woohoo! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Okay. You can go home tonight and lay your head on your pillow and go, Jesus, I suffered for you today. I'm sure he'll give you a nice stroke in and tell you how brave you are. And then he'll show you some Chinese man in a cave trying to hide out, trying to pray with one little piece of paper or read a little scripture. Amen. Jesus breathed out his breath. Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to talk briefly about the sevenfold spirit of God. You can read in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. Uh, John refers to the sevenfold spirit of God multiple times. But here in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah actually speaks to us about the sevenfold spirit of God. It says, There came forth a shoot out of the stalk of Jesse, and a branch out of its roots... Um, shall grow and bear fruit. Now, that branch is Jesus. That's why the branch is capitalized. It, um, uh, we're talking about Jesus the Nazarene here. Do a study there. We'll... Bunny trail. Never mind. Verse 2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and of the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding, and his delight shall be in the reverential, obedient fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, neither decide by the hearing of his ears. But the righteousness and justice shall he judge the poor and decide with fairness for the meek, the poor, and the downtrodden of the earth. Look at this sentence. He shall smite the earth and the oppressor with the rod of his mouth and with what? The breath of his lips. So I want to think about Jesus being on the cross and him breathing out. <laughs> his breath. And what was happening? By his breath that was parting from his lips, he was defeating the oppressor. <laughs> Jesus mighty God. The wicked were getting into order by the breath of God, by the spirit of God. He destroys the oppressor of the wicked one. Oh my gosh. Look at Isaiah 59 verse 19. This is just as good. <laughs> Y'all know this scripture, especially if you're like any kind of intercessor at all. You say this all the time. Probably haven't seen it, but here we go. So, as a result of the Messiah's intervention, okay, so we know, we're talking about Jesus' intervention here, right? They shall reverently fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the, sign, the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, 
the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him and put him to flight. Now, look how the Amplified amplifies this. For he will come like a Russian, a Russian, not a Russian stream. He's not a Russian. He is a rushing, sorry, a rushing stream, which the breath of the Lord drives. How many times have you been in prayer like, I know that the Lord said he will raise up a standard against the enemy. You know what that standard is? It's the breath of God. It's the spirit of God. And guess how it comes at your enemies? Through your lips, through your mouth. The spirit of the Lord drives the standard as you and I speak what the spirit says. In the power of his spirit. It is the spirit of God that doesn't just give us life. And he doesn't just baptize us. It's the spirit of God that defeated our enemy. Oh, Jesus. That's good stuff. So Jesus raises up from the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then he hangs out with the disciples and decides he, you know, don't you wish you were kind of like that? Like you could just like walk in through the wall and be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> oh, I'm sure he was entertained. Okay. So now remember, the disciples had been with Christ, right? They were following him, but they had not been born of the Spirit. They were followers of Jesus. They were they were followers that he chose to be apostles and disciples, but they had not been yet born of the Spirit yet. And the Word tells us, Jesus said, you must be born of the Spirit. So before Jesus ascends back up into the Father, he meets them and he has a conversation with them. And in John chapter 20, 19, in verse 19, it says, That evening the disciples gathered together, and because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jewish leaders, they had locked the doors to the place where they met. And, but suddenly Jesus appeared among them and said, Peace to you. And then he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were overjoyed to see the Lord with their own eyes. And Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you, he told them. Just as the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. And then, then taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I send you to preach forgiveness of sins, and people's sins will be forgiven. But if you don't proclaim the forgiveness of their sins, they will remain guilty. In this moment, those apostles became living souls. They are not being filled with the Spirit. They are receiving their born-again moment. By the Spirit of God. And they got it directly from his lips, breathing on them. Can you imagine, Lord have mercy? Like what? Oh, must have smelt like freaking amazing. Oh, it's so fragrant. Do you get it? Roses and goodness. Sweet apple pie. So now the disciples are living souls. So Jesus breathes on them. They become born again. He goes back up into heaven. And he tells them, I want you to wait for me. And I'm going to come back to you. And when I do, I'm going to give you the promise that I told you. Back when we were sitting around the Last Supper table, back in John 14, I was telling you guys it's super important that I go away because I'm going to come back again. And when I come back again, I'm going to live in you. And so he just made them ready to be lived in in a whole other way. And so they get together. They go. They're having their prayer meetings. And I'm going to read all this, and you've had your Bible study for the day. Acts chapter 2. Look, this is the birthday of the church. That's what Pentecost is. When you look at a menorah, that's the light of God, right? The, the three on this side are the first three feasts. Three on this side are the last three feasts. And in the middle, that middle rung there, that middle light is Pentecost. That middle one lights it all. The sevenfold spirit of God. The spirit of God is the middle one. It lights all the others. Okay, so Acts chapter 2. It says, On the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled. All the disciples were gathered in one place, and suddenly they heard a sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. This was not, this was not an ordinary sound. It was so loud that everybody around heard it. 
even the people outside. There were many believers that were there in Jerusalem because they were there to give first fruits. And first fruits was one of the feasts that you had to go to Jerusalem to give. And so there were multiple, multiple people there, and they all heard it. It says, the roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. Oh, my God. Remember that pillar walking with them in the wilderness when they left Egypt? They had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Imagine that pillar of fire manifesting itself in the upper room and then a flame shooting over there and a flame shooting over there. Oh, oh my God. Could you imagine? That's what's happening. That same pillar of fire that led them through all of the wilderness is now presenting itself. The breath that made Adam a living soul, the breath that created the heavens and the earth and everything we know, that breath was breathing and the sound was overbearing. They couldn't even imagine. I mean, they were like freaking out. It wasn't like, oh, gee, oh, I thought, yeah. oh, I feel a goosebump. They were freaking undone. They were messed up. They were set ablaze by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had the top taken off their head, and he poured fire and breath inside of them. And when they got done with that moment, they were all speaking in tongues. All of them were speaking different languages, different dialects. And there were people that were outside. You can read it for yourself. I'm just paraphrasing now. There were people outside walking. They were like, How are you, you ain't from Turkey. How are you speaking my language? You're not from Iran. How are you speaking my language? They were freaking out. Let me tell you what. You can argue a doctrine all day long. You can argue with me all day long about what you think you believe. But when I start talking to you in Russian, and you ain't dang good will, and I don't know no Russian, you'd be like, that's something. <laughs> you may not say that's the Holy Ghost, but you're like, that's something. There is nothing better than when you're in a situation where you have to have Holy Spirit. When I travel overseas, I'm like, I don't know your language. You don't know my language. And they're like, oh, yes, mama, yes, mama. I don't, ha I don't have my Christianese to lean on. I can't be like, fire, fire. Oh, in the name of Jesus. You know how we do. It's all fake. It's all BS. What's real is when it's you and someone who's hurting and someone who's dying, and the only thing that you have between them and you is the Spirit of God. And you better know who you are in Christ, so you've had the Spirit of God on you and the Spirit of God within you to where you can hear what, he said, just like I am with the Father, I'll be in you. So Jesus wasn't, he, he just walked up to them and he knew everything about him. Well, that's because Jesus was special. I'm sorry, no, the sevenfold Spirit of God. That spirit of prophecy, that spirit of wisdom and understanding, that was in Jesus. And guess what he gave to you and I when he baptized us in the spirit of God? He baptized us in the spirit of prophecy, wisdom, and understanding. So that means whatever he needs, I can hear. They were like, they're drunk. They are drunk. And Peter's like, whatever. You know you know I don't speak Russian. You know it. All y'all know I don't speak no German. I'm like, you know, he was like, come on, you guys know. Y'all know Thomas. You know he ain't speaking Spanish. Give me a break. We are not drunk. And he begins to tell them, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Oh. <laughs> uh, Look at verse 17. This is what he says. He goes, this is what I will do in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and your daughters to prophesy. That word everybody is so important. And your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. And the Holy Spirit will come upon all of my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I'll reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of clouds will appear for the sun will be turned dark and the moon blood red for the great and awesome appearance of the day of the Lord. 
but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter's like, look, y'all can try to figure this out all you want, but you and I both know this is God. It is not me. And this is what was promised by Joel. And Peter's standing there remembering what Jesus said at the Last Supper, saying, I've got to go away so that I can come back and I can fill you with who I am so that you can be just like me on the earth. And Peter's in that moment understanding this is why I denied him. And this is why he brought me back into right fellowship with him. Because I'm going to stand here today and I'm going to tell all of you, this is what God has done. And they were so, they were so quick in their heart. They said, what can we do? And he said, repent, be saved, and be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that day, 3,000 men, not including women and children, we don't even know how many that would have been, they were added that day. And from that moment on, the church has multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And Charles Childs posted an article on his Facebook the other day, and it said that only 47% of the people in the Temple Belton, Waco area really believe in God. read it. Go on his Facebook and look. I'll post it on the church page. 47% in our city. It's not because the Spirit of God's not wanting to come. It's because the Spirit of God is in you, and he's in you, and he's in you, and he's in you, and nobody will know as long as we discuss doctrines. But until we honor the Spirit of God and we go back to those days when we see Benny Hinn talking about good morning, Holy Spirit. Oh, he changed the church world with that entire book. It was phenomenal. Good morning. Go pull it up. Go buy it on Amazon or iBooks. Do yourself a favor if you've never read it. Go read good morning, Holy Spirit. He taught us how fellowship with the Spirit of God. I'd say he, I mean, millions of people have done it before him, but I'm saying in my generation, he taught us that communion with the Holy Spirit every day will not just change your life, it will change the lives of everybody around you. Temple needs the church, amen. But you know what? It needs the church in you before it needs this building. Romans chapter 8 tells us that we've received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. It says that his spirit testifies together with our spirit, letting us know that we are sons of of God, who've received the spirit of adoption, and we cry Abba because he's released us from the bondage of the spirit of fear, the fear of being unwanted, the fear of being unloved, the fear of being unknown, the fear of being lost, the fear of being in death for the rest of your life. He's taken all of that away from us, and he's given us the spirit of life, and we come in this place today not just to be having our church service. We're coming to remind ourselves that we need to honor the very Holy One who he gave us. He purposely laid down his life so that you and I could carry and be baptized with this amazing Holy, Holy Spirit. He is not a goosebump. He is not a revelation. He is holy. And he is worthy. He is worthy of our surrender. He's worthy of our surrender. He's worthy of our communion. He's worthy of our devotion. He deserves more honor than we give him. And I refuse. I said this morning, standing right there, I will not spend another day of my life fighting against what you've put inside of me. I will not do it. I will not do it. I will not do it. I pussyfooted around too long. I'm not going to do it anymore. I have been given the spirit of the living God. And you have been given the spirit of the living God. And if you haven't had a fresh baptism, today is your day to get one. He is not just sitting back waiting, okay, well, I guess, you know, if they're really earnest, I'll do it. He's so awesome. But he does just say, I want you to be willing. And the same fire, that same pillar that split off and baptized all of those in the upper room is the same spirit and fire 
that baptizes us today. There's no difference. We don't get a junior Holy Spirit. We don't get just a smaller measure. It's the exact same thing that they experienced in that upper room. And if we lessen it and we diminish it, we dumb it down any, even any more than that, we are wrong. There used to be this thing going around, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. I don't think the church is ashamed of the gospel. Ain't no church in, in the United States of America ashamed of the gospel. But there's a whole bunch of people ashamed of the Holy Ghost. There's a whole bunch of people who don't want the demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. But I'm saying, we ain't quenching him in this joint no more. Amen? So if you want a fresh baptism, I'm going to tell you, stand up. I'm not going to touch you. It's not up to me to touch you. And I can't make it happen. I ain't got no abracadabra, nothing like that. But what I do have, I give to you. I feel so unworthy to even say what I have I give you, honestly. But it is not by my good works. And it's not even by my surrender. It's just the goodness of God and the love of God and the spirit of God. You know, just mercy this morning realigned my heart. I love Jesus. And I know most of you in here, look, there's a few of you here that don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't care. A couple of you are curious. But the rest of you, you all know Jesus. And most of you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Some of you haven't. and You've been kind of lying about it and trying to act like, you, you know, but just admit it. It's okay. You can get filled. It's not to oppress anybody. But even when we love God, you know, we can move away from him. Not even because we're in sin, just because we just move away. You know what I mean? Like our heart just begins to navigate and get pulled to a different direction. You know, and, and all I can say is my own testimony is that I just started telling God, I don't want to be away from you anymore. And I'm trying to claw my way back, and I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. And I don't want to live empty anymore. I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm tired of putting on a happy face. <laughs> And I didn't do anything to make my heart right. But mercy came. Mercy just said, I love you. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. I still so fervently and passionately love you. I know he's tried to do that to me a couple of times, but for some reason today, I was just like, I'm ready. I'm ready to accept your mercy. And I felt something so holy hit my heart. I can't really tell you what it was. All I know is I just got, I was right again with God. I was just right with Jesus. I was right. I'm in the right place with him right now. And I'm going to try my hardest to hold on to this as I go through the day and as I go to on tomorrow. But right now, you know, I may miss it and I may not. But right now, I know I'm right with God. I know I felt his presence and he filled me once again with his presence and his spirit afresh and anew. Because yesterday's baptism was not going to do it for me today. So I just feel like maybe some of you need mercy. Some of you just need to receive his mercy. He is not mad at you. He loves you so much. I feel like this is almost like Holy Communion, taking the, the bread and the crackers, the moment where you just, you know, repent and just say, okay, I receive you. 
I receive you. I can't make myself clean. I can't make myself right. I can't make myself alive. So I just take all the mercy that you have for me. And I just, I drink it in. So, Father, we thank you for your mercy this morning. We thank you that it's never ending, that every morning it's brand new again. And we know that tomorrow morning, no matter what, you're going to look at us the same way you are right now. This moment, we're vulnerable and we're surrendering to you. That you and your goodness, you take us out of our filth and you wash away all of our tears and the stains on us and you just make us right again. So, Father, I just pray every heart that needs that same ridiculous loving touch that you gave my heart this morning, that they would receive it, that they would know that they are accepted and beloved by you, that you're not angry at them, that you're not disappointed, that you've just been waiting with bated breath for this moment to just shower mercy. Spirit, we're so thankful for you. We just honor you. You are not a it. You are not a thing. You are holy. You are our comforter and our friend. You are our peace and our truth. And we just honor you. We give you reverence this morning, Holy Spirit. We're so thankful that you, you chose to live in us and among us. And as we honor you this morning, Holy Spirit, I would just ask that as we've gathered and said yes on our hearts, that you would just begin to fresh, just a fresh wind and a fresh breath over every heart that's longing for it this, mor- this moment, that every heart that's longing for a fresh touch and a baptism from you, that you would do it right now, that you would just pour from heaven whatever touch they need, whatever whatever thing that they need right now to be filled throughout their entire being with your presence and with your, and just with your amazing love. Let it just wash over and in every heart let it just be gushing over and let new wine begin to come forth mark our hearts this day Lord and let an altar be built that we can pass by again and again to remember and to honor you because this is the turning point that you have prophesied This is the turning point that you have declared over us. This is the point of reactivation that you have talked to us about. And we receive you this morning. So come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. need to worship just a little bit so if you need to leave you can go but I'm going to tell you if you do please be honorable but if you want to come up here for worship I I'm sure the gifts will flow I just don't know what to do yet so just invite you to come and worship and just give your heart afresh and anew we love you I love you thank you so much for giving me your time this morning we love you Jesus May you be glorified and magnified, God. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We're hungry for you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, come.
We just thank you, Jesus. There's not much more we can say, but thank you. And that we love you. Father, we give you honor and glory for the touch that you've given our hearts this morning. For the altar you created for us this day. I ask that you would hold close those who you've brought near. And I pray for an increase of desire and devotion. That the seed and the word that you've planted in us today, Lord, let it bring forth abundant fruit to bring you honor and to bring you fame. In Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. We pray that you're blessed.